So many new releases and updates here before the end of the new year. Let's start off with one of the biggest news stories of the last week. As Mozilla's new CEO, Anthony, is taking over the Mozilla Corporation as of December 16th, 2025. And he said that the next chapter for the company is going to be about trusted software and mentioned some goals and direction as the company looks like it's going to shift Mozilla Firefox into the AI landscape as there was mention of making Mozilla Firefox into a modern AI browser. This sparked quite a bit of backlash. I do have a video dissecting this entire thing. Cue that up as the next video, but we get a pretty large update on a Reddit post nonetheless. An open letter to the Mozilla's new CEO, Firefox doesn't need AI, it needs leadership that listens. And lo and behold, we got a response from none other than Anthony. Hello, Anthony here. I appreciate the input and feedback. Please keep it coming. To be successful, Firefox should serve almost everyone. Browsers are a unique product. It's a product that has to work for just about everyone on the planet. Developers, Linux users, shout out. Students, parents, and people who never change the default setting. Their needs differ. Sometimes they conflict. My job is not to ignore one group to serve another. It is to make Firefox work for everyone without losing its core values. Rest assured, Firefox will always remain a browser built around the user control. That includes AI. You will have a clear way to turn off AI features. A real kill switch is coming quarter one, 2026. Choice matters in demonstrating our commitment to choice is how we built and maintain trust. So not many people are happy about this decision, but what the CEO is now saying is that we're going to get some magic kill switch that's going to completely turn off the AI. Well, that's interesting as it sounds more like an opt out situation at this point instead of an opt in situation. So this is also sparking a bunch of backlash again, rightfully so as many people don't really want AI just baked into their browser and having to jump through hoops in order to actually turn things off. Anyways, it is interesting that Anthony did answer this Reddit post as he's scouring Reddit. We'll see what transpires out of this one. In a new commit emerged from AMD, Linux kernel 6.19 is bringing a big upgrade for older AMD, Radeon, GCN 1.0 and 1.1 cards. This pertains to cards like the HD 7000 and 8000 and some R9 200 models. By switching the GPUs to a newer AMD GPU driver and defaulting the legacy Radeon driver, there's been reports of up to a 30% boost in performance. Plus Vulkan support is now out of the box via RADV. So big news for Linux users still running older AMD Radeon cards. This is exciting news for Linux kernel 6.19. Researchers have recently proposed a new way to extend the Linux kernel by using safe Rust code instead of eBPF. Rex aims to make kernel extensions easier to write and safer while still offering similar protections and the flexibility of eBPF programs. EBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet and is a safe way to run small programs inside the Linux kernel without crashing them. People use it for tracking slow apps or system calls, advanced networking and load balancing, and security tools that are watching for suspicious behavior. Now, of course, kernel maintainers are a little skeptical on this one as they are cautious that EBPF already works and changing the kernel extensions is a risky deal. The main concerns include EBF's verifier is very strict and has been tested over many, many years. They don't want complexity creep in or fragmentation and Rust doesn't just make everything better. So it'll be interesting if this Rex project actually gets traction. And we just had the Linux Plumbers Conference in Tokyo, Japan, which brought a lot of interesting things, including a Linux CPU scheduler originally built to make Valve Steam Deck feel fast and smooth is now being used by Meta. On its massive data centers, engineers found the same scheduler adapts surprisingly well from handheld devices to hyperscale workloads. So interestingly enough, Meta is now testing this CPU scheduler again, built for Valve Steam Deck across some of their servers. And the goal here is a default scheduling solution for the rest of Meta services. And the challenges include varied hardware, CPU and cache technologies, and varied workloads, batch bursty networking. Go figure, Meta keeps benefiting from Linux and open source. And some more news from the Linux Plumbers Conference, achieving ASIL B qualified Linux while maintaining expectations from upstream kernel. Who is this for? Well, for vehicle manufacturers, robotics, and industrial and civil safety providers. For example, their wildfire monitoring. Another interesting proposal from NVIDIA who is now exploring how to make Linux safe for these types of applications, focusing on meeting the automotive safety standards, which is the ACLB, and not trying to force these changes into the mainline kernel. The company says it wants Linux to work for safety critical systems while keeping upstream development unchanged. Of course, this makes sense for NVIDIA. Why not use free and open source software in order to advance their profit as this is the next market that they clearly want to dominate. 
it already has the brains or the GPUs and advanced AI cards that it uses for cars and robots so that it can power autonomous and assisted driving systems. But now they want to focus in on standards in order to be able to sell these things. A lot of us understand that NVIDIA is no longer just a GPU company. It's got frameworks, it's got CUDA, and plenty of software stacks. This, of course, will strengthen NVIDIA's full stack system. We'll see if we really gain anything from this or if it's just NVIDIA's gain at the end of the day. As we all know, in the past, they haven't worked well with Linux, but as of late, they have been contributing a lot more to open source. An Ubuntu developer says that Google's Gemini AI and other AI is producing sloppy and confusing code, even when writing really small, simple scripts, showing the struggle that real-world Linux kernel development and just development in general really needs heavy human input. As they try to play around with AI again, this time Gemini to help write a tiny helper script, I'd say it was the same kind of issues with Copilot. It doesn't think, so makes silly mistakes, and can't figure out the semantic of things, quickly leading to badly named variables and, and adds to the confusion of reading a script that often splits the responsibilities of work weirdly between functions. And this seems to be the experience of a lot of developers nowadays. As code gets complicated and fragmented by AI, it really puts into question how code should really be built, reviewed, and trusted, and what challenges AI brings into the game, especially when it comes to scale and maintainership. As maintainers will struggle with the trade-offs of AI in the future, and this is just one of them, it's interesting that it's coming from Ubuntu. And just about everywhere in the kernel, we're trying to make AI fit. This should bring into question whether or not it's even necessary to use AI. But on the other hand, if you haven't subscribed below, make sure to subscribe right now and smash that like button on the way back up. You wouldn't want to miss another news segment like this. And here's some interesting news as we receive updates for Weston, which is a reference compositor for Wayland, which is really a proving ground and test bed for a lot of developers where they can use Wayland. But what's exciting about this is Weston 15 Alpha just came out and it's bringing new Wayland protocols, better HDR and color handling and a scriptable Lua based shell. This is all experimental as it's a big developer focus up that previews where Wayland compositors are heading next. Initially, this was scheduled for October, but we decided to further postpone it to have some additional time for landing protocols, support like FIFO, commit timing and color representation, which is great to hear as we may see a January 26th official stable Weston 15 release. So this is great because Weston again is a reference implementation of the Wayland compositor. Basically, it shows how Wayland is supposed to work. And at a high level, it helps developers talk to apps via Wayland and render the final scene using graphics API to display things via the kernel's graphical stack. Unlike using GNOME's Mutter or KDE's KWIN, Weston allows minimal code, fast testing, and focuses on correctness, protocols, and performance of actually using Wayland. So it's always great to see these improvements coming to Weston and that it's maturing and tackling problems like we have with HDR and latency in Wayland. We'll see if we ever get those accessibility tools like we see on X, but now I wanna talk about a removal from the Linux kernel. The upcoming Linux 7.0 kernel will remove support for AMD's NPU2, an early AI accelerator that was never released as a real product. AMD says the unused code is not worth maintaining, so it's simply removing it from the Linux kernel AI driver stack. You can see here with a couple of lines as it takes out the NPU2 registers and cleans up the structure. And there's much more that gets completely removed from the code, but it's always nice to see this type of cleanup taking place as it keeps the Linux kernel lean and understandable. Less code means fewer bugs and lower maintenance burden for developers. AMD has done a good job of contribution to the Linux kernel and AMD for a long time has treated Linux as a first class platform while Nvidia has historically treated it as a compatibility problem. AMD works on upstream first. Nvidia has always relied on closed out of tree models for years. We've always loved AMD for sharing its hardware details early and we can all see that AMD really takes its time as one of the best upstream kernel contributors among hardware vendors. So it's always nice to kind of see this cleanup taking place. I know it's not bigger flashy news, but I do like covering little simple things like this as well. And if you want to level up your Linux experience today, check out my checklist, cheat sheet, and my map all available at SavvyNick.com. Get those sheets today. Not necessarily Linux related, but open source related, Lua 5.5 is officially out. The first major release in five years, bringing a few things, including declarations for global variables, much lower memory usage for large arrays, around 60% less in what is called more compact arrays, 
and faster, more incremental garbage collection, which is a big win for this lightweight scripting language that is becoming more efficient. And for those of you unaware, Lua is a tiny scripting language that's usually embedded inside of things like games or tools, other applications to make them flexible without actually slowing them down. And you might be asking, why not just use Python? Well, the core difference is that Lua is tiny in size compared to Python's large runtime. It's got very fast startup speeds and very low overhead. So it just makes it shine, especially when you want to embed the scripting language in your own applications. Anyways, big wins after five years of development. I told you there were a lot of updates over the last week. And another big update is the announcement of the release of MPV 0.41. MPV is a lightweight, high quality open source video editor, popular with Linux users and power users across platforms. With MPV 0.41, this brings better Wayland support, improved HDR and color handling because the protocol was exposed with Wayland not too long ago. They're finally bringing this in. And now it offers a Vulkan based hardware video decoding where available. A big upgrade for modern Linux desktops and GPUs. For those of you using MPV, rejoice as we get quite a few improvements with the lightest 0.41 release. One note is that it does require FFmpeg 6.1 or newer and lib placebo 6.338. Point two or newer. Another cool thing is that it supports ambient light support on Linux now. And again, the biggest deal is probably these two color representation protocol support for Wayland and table input support for Wayland. This means HDR for us. If you haven't heard of MPV, you can check it out at mpv.io. Anyways, here's an interesting one which we just landed a fix for. With Linux kernel 6.19, we have a small but important fix for Seagate Barracuda 2 terabyte HDDs. The issue was that the entire system SATA bus could go offline, and this is all related to a power saving feature for that specific drive model. The kernel has now disabled the problematic power saving feature and prevents crashing and drive dropouts for the affected users. And this here is the long running Linux kernel bug report that ended up tracing down why some people's systems and SATA drives suddenly vanished on newer kernels. Again, because of that power management quirk and large IO commands inevitably created failures in certain drives and controllers. Months of testing helped pinpoint what was actually happening, ultimately leading to this now patch. Now this doesn't affect many people, but, but do understand if you're a Seagate Barracuda hard disk user and your SATA bus is acting unpredictably, well, 6.19 is going to include a fix for you. And something interesting for Arch Linux users, with the update to driver version 590, the NVIDIA driver no longer supports Pascal GTX 10 series GPUs or older, and which has forced Arch Linux to move to NVIDIA's open kernel modules by default. If you have an older NVIDIA card, you'll need to switch to the legacy driver or risk losing your desktop after upgrading. So again, if you're on an older GTX 10 series or earlier, the NVIDIA driver won't load anymore. You must manually install the legacy NVIDIA driver to, to keep your graphics working. And this all aligns with Arch Linux and NVIDIA's push to towards an open source kernel driver. Pretty big news for legacy driver users. Again, NVIDIA 590 driver drops Pascal support. Here's some interesting news from a name I haven't heard in a while. Elementary OS 8.1 is available now, which uses Wayland as default, bringing improvements to the desktop of elementary OS. X11 session is still around for users who want it, but this is the biggest improvement that we're seeing with 8.1. As they tested things out in elementary OS 8 last November with the new secure session powered by Wayland, we now see it being used by default. And we're also seeing other improvements with 8.1 besides the Wayland by default switch, which was driven heavily by real user feedback over 1100 issues fixed, including stronger privacy and security with improved app armor and new password dialogues, fractional display scaling, dock upgrades, app center improvements, and overall a faster, clearer system and application updates. Maybe I get to dive into this one. It's been a while since I've explored elementary OS. If you want me to, post it in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. And moving on to Linux Mint 22.3 Xena, the beta release is now available, which is bringing new Cinnamon 6.6 .6 desktop with a refreshed app menu, smoother files management, and small quality of life improvements, all built around 24.04, the long-term support edition of Ubuntu. So for those of you who want to try out the new Cinnamon desktop 6.6, .6, you can now try out the beta before we get an official release of Linux Mint 22.3. 
Moving on to desktops now, this week in Plasma, we get ambient light sensor support, which is a big deal as this is a notable new feature and has been long awaited as ambient light sensor support on modern laptops allows for automatic brightness adjustment on the devices with these types of sensors. A big win for laptop users as a lot of us have this sensor nowadays. And also another big deal added a workaround for Windows games with HDR support to make sure their colors still look good when running in Wine or Proton. This is a cool deal so we don't get washed out or clipped colors when HDR is enabled through KDE while using things like Wine and Proton, aka trying to run Windows games on our Linux machines. Another great improvement, all via Plasma 6.6. Man, so many updates in the last week or so. A lot to catch up on. Thanks for sticking around. Let's talk about the System D 259 release. This now adds new experimental Musil libc support, better container friendliness, faster module loading, and a pile of security updates including for boot and service management, but some of the biggest policy and changes include System 5 and its script support is deprecated and will be removed with System D 260. TPM 1.2 support is fully removed, so you only have TPM 2.0. Journal storage defaults are now persistent instead of automatic. The IP tables based NAT is gone. You only have NF tables. Huge table memory support is now counted in C group memory usage. So we're cutting out quite a bit of legacy tech support and tightening our security, including improving containers, TPM support, and of course other services. In an interesting move from Red Hat, it is acquiring Chatterbox Labs, an AI safety and testing firm to strengthen its enterprise AI platform, focusing on AI guardrails, bias detection, and model security. And there are plans to open source this technology over time. An interesting move by Red Hat as it continues to try to be a player in the AI space. They go more into the announcement and why they actually did this and who Chatterbox actually is. But the main idea here is to provide a safe, compliant, and audible way to run AI on their systems. As AI is a security risk for Red Hat and other Linux distributions, positioning themselves to be a company who can sell to enterprises when AI stops being experimental and it becomes safe and enterprise ready. Another big piece of news, the Linux kernel officially received its first ever CVE that was tied directly to Rust code. It involved a race condition in the Rust-based Android binder driver, and this bug could cause crashes, but no severe security exploits were found. This email from Greg Crow Hartman goes into depth on what actually happened and how this exploit was found. I go much more into depth in a dedicated video about this whole situation. Definitely check that out if you're interested. But really, what we found was a bit of code that was unsafe dealing with linked lists, which was unsafe because if another thread was accessing the code in parallel, it could cause corrupted memory, broken lists, or just crashes. It's a data race condition here with multiple threads trying to access the same pointers at the same time. Lenovo ThinkPad users are seeing interesting support added into the Linux kernel called Add Support to Detect hardware damage detection capability. This is a proposal to add support to let Lenovo ThinkPads report detected hardware damage to the operating system, starting with checks for damaged USB-C ports so that users and tools can be warned about premature failure if it is detected. It's very interesting. It would be really cool to see these types of things added to the kernel where we could detect whether or not something's going out before it actually goes out perhaps, or if it's truly gone out completely. It's an interesting move, and I wonder if more hardware vendors will use this as a stepping stone to create their own set of tools and conditions that can catch that can detect hardware damage. It's pretty cool in my opinion. Let me know what you think about this. Do you have a ThinkPad yourself? You could potentially benefit from this one. And I'm gonna end things here as we covered a ton of news today. A lot went down in the last week or so. And let me know in the comment section below what you found the most interesting over the last week. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe below and smash that like button on the way back up. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.